Hello again, listeners. We're going to talk here about complement deficiencies. Now, complement deficiencies, remember, complement is part of your immune system, part of your innate immune system. When we think of deficiencies to something that's part of the immune system, so like a B cell deficiency, a T cell deficiency, issues with your macrophages, issues with, uh, with phagocytes, uh, we're thinking that this is going to cause an immunodeficiency, and certainly there are parts of the complement system that if you have a deficiency, it's going to cause an immunodeficiency. Now that having been said, complement deficiencies do not always present as an immunodeficiency. As a matter of fact, the early complement deficiencies that we're going to talk about here have a tendency, not always, but a tendency to present as autoimmune disorders. Now why is that? You have a deficiency of complement. It's part of your innate immune system. We think that should be an immunodeficiency. And an autoimmune disorder is, we think of sort of imperfectly, as an overactive immune system. And that is really, it's true. Uh, your immune system is doing something it's not supposed to be doing. But why would a deficiency in the innate immune system cause an autoimmune manifestation? And we're going to talk about why that is. So our vignette here gives us a 19-year-old woman presenting to your clinic complaining of generalized joint pain and fatigue over the last four months. She was seen by a physician six weeks ago for the same complaints. Hemoglobin was then normal. She was discharged with the instructions to get more sleep. Yeah, a lot of young people don't get enough sleep. She presently takes NSAIDs for the joint pain, but it does not seem to be helping. On her chart, you note that she has been in good health. Family history is non-contributory. She's a college freshman and works part-time as a residential advisor in her dorm. She denies drug or alcohol use and is not sexually active. Her present medications include ibuprofen taken as needed, clindamycin benzoproxide topical for acne vulgaris, and a multivitamin. Physical exam reveals a mild facial acne form rash in a malar distribution. There is plus one for edema in both ankles. CBC is remarkable for a mild normocytic anemia, hemoglobin 11.4 normal range, and uh, women would usually be around 12 to 15-ish. Mean corpuscular volume, 83. CMP reveals a mild elevation in liver enzymes. Your analysis is significant for 1 plus protein, 2 plus red blood cells, red blood cell casts, and uh, is negative for nitrites or white blood cells. Sed rate is 28 millimeters per hour. Normal would be about 22 millimeters per hour or less. So what have we got here? Go ahead and pause if you want to read this a little bit better. I know I went through it kind of fast. So you have a patient with joint pain and fatigue. And when you have a younger person with joint pain, that's kind of a red flag because if she was 49 or certainly 59 and obese, we would think this is probably osteoarthritis. Let's get a radiograph of the knees and see if there's any joint space narrowing. But she is young, and young people don't get joint pain unless there is something up. Now, some of the more common things you think of are just sort of general inflammatory issues, mononucleosis, she's kind of at that age, that can cause some sort of joint pain, fatigue, malaise, stuff like that, maybe Lyme disease if it's in the summer, and she's got joint pain, especially if there's a rash, she does have a rash, but not the kind we would see in Lyme's disease, uh, and lots of other things that can cause uh, generalized joint pain, uh, but most of them are very abnormal, it just does not happen as the, you know, in a normal 19-year-old. Uh, so she's got joint pain and fatigue, and not only does she have joint pain and fatigue, but it's been going on for a while, four months. Uh, so anytime you have a patient with joint pain and fatigue that's chronic, you're thinking possibly an autoimmune disorder. Now, there are a lot of autoimmune disorders that you can have, and joint pain and fatigue are just sort of your basic symptoms for a lot of the autoimmune disorders. You have to look at other symptoms that are present, because otherwise this is pretty nonspecific. So you look at some of the other things that she's got, uh, and what comes up here is that acneiform rash. And an acneiform rash uh, can be a lot of things. It can be just regular acne, but she's got it in a malar distribution. And malar is such a, I mean, this is such a, uh, a key word for a certain disorder. But if I, were to, if I were to have given you a picture, you should know what a malar distribution is. It's, it's kind of a distribution over the upper cheeks, kind of sparing the nasolabial areas, going underneath the eyes and maybe to the side of the face a little bit. 
And this is very typical of lupus. Uh, so you've got a patient with joint pain and fatigue, malar rash. Uh, you're thinking probably lupus. Now there's other things that you could add on to joint pain and fatigue that might make you think of other autoimmune disorders. So for instance, joint pain plus fatigue plus genital ulcers, maybe Bissette syndrome, joint pain plus fatigue plus lower back pain, and sort of a rigid lower back, could be ankylosing spondylitis, joint pain plus fatigue plus dry mouth, dry eyes, possibly Sjogren's syndrome. All of these things have a tendency to present, well, with the exception of ankylosing spondylitis, have a tendency to present early on in life, especially in young women. So what do we do with this? We think possibly lupus. Lupus has a tendency to present in younger women, especially younger women of color, Hispanic, black. So we're going to go ahead and uh, get some lab work. And a CBC is always a good place to start. Uh, it shows a mild normocytic anemia. Now that contrasts with last time. She was not anemic. Um, let's see where and she had normal hemoglobin, um, but she uh, was discharged to get more sleep. Well, that's probably okay. I mean, malaise plus uh, fatigue in a younger person, fatigue is, uh, I mean, not getting enough sleep is a possibility, especially since she's in college and college kids have a tendency to not get sleep uh, as they should, busy with classwork and everything extracurriculars. Uh, so that was probably fine for the physician to discharge her with. Certainly if she had this malar rash, she probably shouldn't have. Uh, but uh, so the, now we see on the CBC that she's got normocytic anemia. And a lot of things can cause anemia in a 19-year-old uh, girl, a woman, but uh, this is normocytic. And uh, typically the anemia that we would see in uh, a 19-year-old woman would be an iron deficiency anemia, typically secondary to menorrhagia. Uh, and so, since this is normocytic, uh, this is possibly something else. Uh, now, you can go either way, BMP or CMP, if you're taking step three. Uh, you can choose either or. I don't think you're going to be docked. I like to go with a CMP anytime I'm getting an initial, if they haven't had electrolytes ran in a while. I like to have a CMP, because, especially if there's something systemic possibly going on, because CMP is going to get you your liver enzymes and various other things that I just think are important to have as a baseline anytime you're evaluating a patient for something that is possibly systemic. Now, if you were to follow her, then you could, and nothing was abnormal uh, in the liver enzymes and stuff like that, you could get BMP, and BMP is good in the hospital to just follow patients' electrolytes, but I like to get a, start off with a CMP, at least to get sort of baseline for, for various things. Uh, so we get a CMP, and it shows a mild elevation in liver enzymes. That could be uh, possibly due to the fact that she's taking NSAIDs uh, frequently, and so I wouldn't make too much of that. Uh, remember, not everything abnormal you see is going to be caused by disease. It could just be uh, variations on normal. It could be because of medications. Uh, but then we do a urinalysis. Why are we doing a urinalysis here? Well, she's got edema. So you could be losing protein in the urine, and that is indeed what's happening. She's losing a little bit of protein in the urine. Certainly not nephrotic syndrome, but she is losing a little bit. Uh, but she also has two plus red blood cells. I could probably make that three plus red blood cells. Uh, but she's losing significant red blood cells in the urine. She's also got casts. And so she's definitely got nephritic syndrome here. And that is another thing that is making us concerned about lupus in this patient, besides the fact that she's got this malar rash, which isn't going away even with a pretty strong acne medication. It is negative for nitrites and white blood cells, which uh, leads us to believe that there is not a, an infectious process going on uh, anywhere in the urinary tract. Uh, and she's also got an increased sed rate, which is uh, a, another red flag for an inflammatory process. So what do we do from here? We are going to get uh, specific tests for lupus. So you could start out with an ANA. That would be the best place to start, really. Uh, ANA has a tendency to be positive in a lot of people, not just people with lupus or autoimmune disorders, uh, but in all, virtually all patients with lupus, vast, vast, vast majority, they will have a positive ANA. So it's sensitive, but not specific for lupus. Anti-DSDNA, you would probably get after you get a positive ANA, but we'll just include it here for uh, completion's sake. 
uh, in this vignette. Anti-DSDNA is much more specific for lupus, along with anti-Smith uh, antibodies, and this also came back positive. So virtually here, we have a diagnosis of lupus. We're going to look at the criteria for lupus, just because lupus is so common with some of the early classical complement deficiencies. Uh, but she's already fulfilling like five or six criteria for lupus. And if you have more than uh, four or more criteria for lupus, the American Rheumatology Association put out, um, you're 95% specific, 85% sensitive for lupus. Now you have a patient, a new patient with lupus. We want to know if this is a complement disorder because patients with complement disorders are slightly immunodeficient and they are immunodeficient uh, for various things, pyogenic infections, uh, Neisseria infections. And so we want to know if this is a complement deficient patient, uh, not because patients with lupus, uh, well, they are more likely to be complement deficient, but uh, not so much because patients with lupus are going to be complement deficient, but because complement deficient patients 50 to 100% of the time have lupus either diagnosed or undiagnosed. So a CH50 test tests for any kind of uh, deficiency along the classical or combined pathways. You can kind of think of this as a CH50 is kind of to the complement system as a PT test is to the coagulation system. It tests various, uh, various components of the pathway all the way down to uh, your combined terminal uh, pathway of the complement system, uh, but it doesn't really tell you what complement factor is abnormal. So you get a CH50, sort of your general test of the classical complement pathway, and you see that it is markedly reduced. And the fact that it's markedly reduced tells you that there is some deficiency along the classical or terminal pathway. So uh, that tells us that it could be a C1 deficiency, C2 deficiency, C4 deficiency, C3 deficiency, C5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, we don't know. Uh, so since she has lupus, it's most likely is she either has a uh, C2, a C1, or a C4 deficiency, possibly a C3 deficiency. However, if she had a C3 deficiency, she'd probably be, and we're going to see uh, with this lecture and uh, the next lecture, uh, if she had a C3 deficiency, she would likely have a significant history for infection. Since C3 of all the complement deficiencies is most likely to give you a significant profile of chronic infection. Uh, so C3 and C4 are within normal limits, but her C2 level is low. And so we diagnosed this patient with systemic lupus erythematosus, of course, associated with a C2 deficiency. So let's look at the complement pathway. We're going to focus here on the early complement pathway, uh, which is really one of three pathways, the classical pathway, the lectin pathway, and the alternative pathway. So we'll look at the complement, uh, the classical complement pathway. So we start out in the classical complement pathway with the C1, and C1 responds to antigen antibody complexes. What that does is it activates C1, allows it to cleave C4 into C4B and C4A. C4A kind of goes off into its own thing. C4B will then allow C2 to be cleaved into C2A and C2B. Uh, C2A is going to interact with C4B to form what's known as a C3 convertase. And this allows uh, the cleavage of C3 into C3B, which is an opsonizer and C3A, uh, which is uh, a factor that uh, will induce inflammation. All right, uh, so most of our complement, and these are just some parenthetical points here, most complement is produced by hepatocytes, the exception being C1Q, uh, which is part of our classical pathway. Uh, Procredin, which is going to be primarily part of all our of, of our alternative pathway, and then uh, C7, uh, which is going to be way down here. Uh, those are all produced in myeloid cells. Uh, factor D, which is part of our alternative pathway, is produced in adipocytes. It's also known as adipsin. And so, for this reason, liver disease can cause an increase in infections. 
Uh, and that's because the hepatocytes are responsible for producing so many of these factors. Production of complement is going to be increased in inflammation. That's a good that's a good response because if you have inflammation, you might have infection. If you have infection, you probably will need more complement. And then certain cytokines can elicit an increase in production as well. Now the complement system itself should be viewed uh, biochemically as a simple set of protein interactions which are ultimately designed to do two things and that is opsonization and that's done with C3B and to a lesser extent inactive C3B which uh, isn't really responsible for opsonization but does help activate macrophages. So that is done, opsonization. And then also to form this terminal membrane attack complex, which we're going to see has really, really important activity in getting rid of Neisseria. Okay, so uh, we talked about complement or the classical complement pathway. Ultimately, it's going to make this C3 convertase. The lectin pathway is similar in nature to the classical pathway uh, in that it goes on to activate C4 and then that goes on to activate C2 and form this C3 convertase. The difference is with the lectin pathway, it is activated by, uh, well, it can be activated by multiple things, but uh, ultimately uh, it's activated either by this mannose binding lectin, MBO, or uh, it can also be activated by immunoglobulins, something called agalactosal IgG. Uh, but it, there, there's different enzymes and proteins involved. But it's similar to the classical pathway in that it involves uh, sort of the same uh, complements, C4 and C2, and makes the C3 convertase, which is really an important step because this is what's going to help you opsonize and also help you form a terminal membrane attack complex. The alternative pathway is a little bit different. So with the alternative pathway, what you have uh, is a pathway that does not require the existence of preformed antibody, which the classical pathway, and to a lesser extent, the lectin pathway require. You have to have antibody. And so in that regard, it's really not, uh, the classical and lectin pathway are not purely innate. The alternative pathway, however, is purely innate. What you can have with the alternative pathway is, and this is really part of why it's so innate, is a takeover of C3. So C3 has a tendency to be hydrolyzed. And when C3 is hydrolyzed, it can then interact with factor B. And factor B is part of what ultimately will be our C3 convertase of the alternative pathway. And so when C3 is hydrolyzed and interacts with factor B, uh, then at this point factor D will cleave B, which is already associated with C3, will cleave B into BA and BB. BB will remain with the, uh, with, with the C3, and this is going to be stabilized by something called properdin. And properdin stabilizes the C3B-BB complex, and this is a C3 convertase once uh, it interacts with another uh, C3B. So uh, what that is then is it's our C3 convertase and this is going to do the exact same thing that C4B2A does in our classical and lectin pathways and that is to uh, stimulate the production of C3B from C3, cleave C3. And once that happens, our, our complement pathway really just becomes accelerated because not only when you form C3 uh, to C3B, not only does that form a C5 convertase, uh, but it also uh, helps you form more C3 convertases as part of your alternative pathway, because remember what you need for the alternative pathway uh, to form your C3 convertases, you need C3B. And you can form C3B in two ways. You can either do that through hydrolysis in your alternative pathway, or you can do that right in the middle here, uh, with your C3 convertase. And so this has a, a, an effect of amplifying your complement pathway. So we're focused here on the early part of the complement system, and that's just including everything we've talked about up until now. So your complement or your classical complement pathway, C1 to C4 to C2, form your C3 convertase. Uh, 
lectin pathway, which is pretty much the same as the classical pathway, the only difference is you've got some different uh, proteins that are going to initiate this, not C1. And then your alternative pathway, which is your purely innate uh, version of activating uh, a C3 convertase. All right, now a couple things I want to add as far as the alternative pathway. Uh, you have activator and non-activator surfaces. And this is what, this whole concept is what helps you, it keeps you from complementing your host cells. So there are two things that are important as far as keeping you from doing that. And that is factor H and factor B. So factor B obviously is going to activate your alternative pathway because it's needed to form the C3 convertase. Factor H, on the other hand, sort of is an inhibitor of this whole process. So non-activator surfaces, meaning your body's own cells pretty much, they bind factor H and factor H displaces factor B. So what does that mean? It means that your body's own cells are going to have more avidity to factor H than to factor B. And the reason for that is just factor H is attracted to sialic acid residues, whereas factor B is more attracted to NAG and mannose residues. And your sci sialic acid residues exist on your own cells, your body's cells, uh, whereas with bacteria, uh, they display NAG and mannose, and that doesn't bind factor H, and therefore it's going to bind factor B. So factor H is, is useful because it displaces factor B. Without factor H, your body cells could bind factor B, and if that happens, you will now form C3 convertases on your body's cells. That is bad because that's going to result in lysis and destruction of your body's cells. And now you can kind of see where we're going with this as far as autoimmune disorders being associated with problems to your early complement pathways. Okay, I think that's all I want to talk about for now. All right, so this is kind of what your this is really boiled down. I got this from Garland Science, and uh, so your classical pathway antibody binds to specific antigen on pathogen surface. It activates C1, which then goes through C4, and C2 forms a C3 convertase, which then is going to cleave C3 into C3A, and importantly C3B, which is an opsonizer. C3A is part of the inflammatory process, and it recruits inflammatory cells. It also, uh, I believe, uh, plays a role in uh, increasing the uh, increasing the uh, fluid leak, capillary leak, uh, and that's going to help you draw in cells as well. There's multiple pathways that this increases inflammation. C3B directly opsonizes pathogens, facilitates uptake and killing by phagocytes, and then uh, when you form C3B, it helps you make your C5 convertase, and C5 is, uh, cleavage of C5 to C5A and C5B is necessary to form that terminal membrane attack complex, which is responsible for killing various gram-negative and uh, gram-negative bacteria and encapsulated or enveloped uh, viruses, uh, but particularly we're talking about Neisseria here. And so anything that is far up, uh, that's defecting the complement system, but particularly issues that are further down low are going to affect your ability to form membrane attack complexes. Now, I know we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves here, but why is it you would think that something, anything really, that affects something early on in this complement pathway is going to affect everything underneath it? And it can there are some of these disorders, especially C3 issues, that certainly do cause increased susceptibility to nicerial infections because you're not forming a membrane attack complex or you're not forming it as much as you should. But why not, if you have a C4 or a C2 deficiency or a C3 deficiency, why are we not getting problems with forming a membrane attack complex? So it's, you would think if you knock something out up here, you're going to knock it out down here too. And the reason is because we have multiple different means of activating these pathways. Uh, so we don't so much see nicerial infections 
uh, as a prominent feature, uh, or really uh, immunodeficiencies in general as a prominent feature early on because we have multiple different ways of generating these C3 convertases. So notice here, you can form a C3 convertase either with C4B2A or with C3BBB. Uh, so if you lack C4, you can form uh, a C3 convertase with C3BBB. If you lack C3, you can form it with C4 to, uh, C4B2A. Uh, so having a deficiency of just one of these is not going to dramatically impact your ability to form uh, a C5 convertase, which requires the, the lysis of C3. So for that reason, if you just have a defect in one of these complements, C, C1, C2, and, or C4, you're not going to necessarily have an increased, uh, significantly increased susceptibility to serial infections. Now, if you have a deficiency in C3, now suddenly your ability to form C5 convertase is going to be impacted on both sides. And so that is going to increase your susceptibility to serial infections because you cannot convert C5 into C5B and hence form your terminal membrane attack complex. All right. So we are going to talk about deficiencies of the C1, C4, C2, and C3 uh, complement factors. We're also going to talk about uh, deficiencies of these regulatory factors, which include factor D, factor B, factor H, and something called propyrdin. And propyrdin is the only positive regulator of the complement pathway. Uh, a lot of these other ones uh, are negative regulators, which is good. We need negative regulators because it's going to keep us from going into autoimmune uh, issues. Remember, autoimmunity is uh, autoimmune issues are going to be the result of complementing things that you shouldn't be complementing. There's one other way we're going to talk about it. So we're going to talk about C1, C4, C2 deficiencies. We're going to talk about the mannose binding lectin deficiency, which is relatively common, uh, and then the alternative uh, pathway deficiencies, which are factor B, factor D, factor H, and propyrdin. Um, I put in red here the, more, uh, the ones of these that are more common and therefore likely more, uh, more likely to come up on, on the test. So deficiencies of the classical pathway. So here we're talking about C1, C4, and C2. Remember that C1 is our first step, responds to antigen antibody complex, and allows you to cleave C4 into C4A and C4B. So a deficiency here is going to result in impaired ability to initiate the classical complement pathway, which is going to result in defective opsonization. However, remember that opsonization happens by forming C3B, and you have lots of ways of forming those C3 convertases, so just having a C1 deficiency really is not going to result in a whole lot of immunodeficiency, so it's going to be a slight increase in infection. What C1 deficiency is associated with, however, I want you to know C1 deficiency is very rare, uh, but if you have a C1 deficiency, it's almost always associated with lupus. Why is it associated with lupus? C1 and C4, uh, and to a lesser extent C2, are responsible for doing a few things. They clear out membrane, or sorry, they clear out uh, antigen, uh, antibody, immune complexes, and they also after you destroy cells, what they're also good for doing is they sort of opsonize, I guess, I don't know if it really is uh, opsonization per se, but they, they mark off various debris uh, that exists and helps you clear it out uh, with macrophages and everything. So you have cellular components from bacteria that you've already destroyed, some kind of garbage laying around. And it helps you get rid of that. Now, if you have all of that garbage laying around and you don't clear that out, this is a great way, especially if some of your own cells were destroyed in the process, this is a great way to generate autoantibodies. And so if you don't have the ability to clear out garbage, let's say garbage from your cells, then you are going to be at an increased risk for generating autoantibodies. So that's another way that you can get uh, autoimmunity 
by having a deficiency of one of these. So C1 deficiency is almost always associated with early onset SLE. Now we're going to see that with all of these deficiencies, C1, C4, and C2, they're all associated with lupus. Uh, C1 deficiency particularly so, but the thing is C1 deficiency is quite rare. Uh, we'll go back here, I think, so only t 10 to 100 reported cases of C1 deficiencies. It's probably more than that, that's just the number that's reported. With C4 deficiency, this is much more common, however, it's generally silent. And it's silent because most patients with C4 deficiency only have a partial C4 def deficiency. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, there are a lot of people that have a partial C4 deficiency, but typically that's not enough to generate autoimmunity or even to really increase your risk for infection. I suppose it's slightly increased, but again, if you have a C4 deficiency, you can still form C3 convertase, and that's really the most important thing. 50% of these patients will have uh, systemic lupus. So again, going back here, not a whole lot of cases of C4 deficiency. Now, with C2 deficiency, there are many reported cases. So C2 deficiency is relatively common compared to these other deficiencies, and the it's most common in white people. Uh, so about 1 in 10,000 patients will have a C2 deficiency that's clinically manifested. Most patients are asymptomatic. Uh, however, in the patients that are symptomatic, most of these patients will present with lupus rather than with immunodeficiencies. Now, again, it is true. With any of these complement deficiencies, you can have immunodeficiency, but it just typically does not present with immunodeficiency. They're far more likely to present with autoimmune issues. And with deficiencies of the classical pathway, uh, they tend to be lupus. But it can be other things. They can present with rheumatoid arthritis. They can have ankylosing spondylitis. They can have, uh, I suppose, hemoly hemolytic uremic syndrome. Uh, so various different things, but typically it is lupus. So how do we manage this? Well, primarily, we're going to be concerned with managing their lupus. Now, here's the problem. These patients, they're going to need treatment for their lupus in many cases, especially since a lot of them can develop nephritis, and ultimately that can lead to, uh, to end-stage liver or end-stage renal failure. And so we do need to manage their lupus. But remember that these patients are already at slightly increased risk for infection. And a lot of the drugs we use for lupus, steroids, cytotoxics, they also increase your risk for infection. You put those two together, now your risk for infection is significant. Uh, so we want to immunize these patients, uh, especially to encapsulated organisms. So uh, we give them immunizations to pneumococcus, immunization to meningococcus, uh, immunization to haemophilus. Uh, and then down here, I put possibly lifelong prophylactic antibiotics. I haven't seen that in any, uh, I've seen that in literature as a possible uh, management, but because these patients don't tend to have serious immune deficiencies, you probably wouldn't do that. So uh, as far as the test, absolutely uh, don't worry about that. But I've seen it in the literature as possibly like an adjunctive treatment. So uh, take it or leave it. Uh, most of these patients, they're going to be referred off to an immunologist and they will make that decision. But certainly you want these patients immunized and then their lupus is going to be managed by a rheumatologist. So what is lupus? Let's, this is a great time as any to review what lupus is because when you're talking about C1, C4, C2 deficiencies, they have a tendency to present as lupus. So lupus is a chronic autoimmune disorder that can affect virtually any organ system. We'll see that based on the clinical criteria for lupus. There's an increased incidence in the early classical complement deficiencies. So you have a patient with lupus, you want to check them for an early classical complement deficiency. But just because a patient has lupus doesn't mean they necessarily have uh, a classical complement deficiency. I think it's like 15% or so, so it's a significant amount, uh, but not a majority by any means. The classic triad for lupus, and it doesn't clinically present this way, uh, all the time, or even the majority of time, I would think. Uh, it's often a lot more complicated than this, but for the test, 
I would bet that they will give you the classic triad for lupus, which is fever, arthralgia, and rash. That being said, that triad is very nonspecific. However, if you have a rash that's in a malar distribution or discoid distribution, which would really be a different kind of lupus called discoid lupus, uh, but very similar in uh, clinical manifestations, uh, or a photosensitive rash, that increases your, uh, your specificity for lupus. About a quarter million people in the U.S. are affected by lupus. Blacks and Hispanics are more likely to be aff affected than whites, and women are far more likely to be affected than men. Uh, so if you have a patient with lupus, far more likely to be a woman than it is to be a man. Nine times more likely. The diagnostic criteria for lupus are to have more than four of the following. So first of all, malar rash, which we saw in this patient, is that's a fixed flat or raised erythema over the malar eminences with a tendency to spare the nasolabial folds. So you can have various different, uh, the rash can look very different. So if it's fixed and flat, it really doesn't look like acne at all. But if it's raised, it can almost have this sort of uh, maculopustular appearance that looks a lot like acne. And so if you have that in a young person, it may be misdiagnosed as acne, as we saw in this patient. That's not uncommon. But it's really the distribution that's going to help you out. A discoid rash is more of a circumscribed rash. There, it's uh, It has a tendency, a discoid rash has a tendency to be in the malar distribution, but it can also be elsewhere. It can be on the arms, on the neck. Uh, but discoid rash is, it almost looks like a coin-like rash uh, where they're, they're circular or ovoid and they're very well circumscribed. Unlike the malar rash, which is more of a classical rash, which isn't very well defined. So these are erythematous raised patches. When they, uh, when they go away, they have a tendency to form scars. Uh, and then you can also have this sort of white... Uh, stuff, which is considered keratotic scaling, uh, but it's sort of like a white patch on the, the rash itself, and uh, that's characteristic of discoid rash. Photosensitivity can be present, so basically these patients have a tendency to sunburn, uh, or what you can see is the patient goes out in the sun for a significant period of time, now they have a malar rash. Uh, then these other things are oral or pharyngeal, uh, nasopharyngeal ulcers. That can be just if the patient tells you or on physical exam. Arthritis, we saw that in this patient. Uh, not, this is non-erosive, so it's not osteoarthritis, involving at least two peripheral joints, so knees, elbows, uh, fingers, and it's characterized by tenderness, swelling, or effusion. Sorry, I spelled effusion wrong there. Uh, Serositis is a little less common to come up, but it can be pleuritis. That can manifest as pleuritic pain, so you take a breath and it hurts. Uh, you can hear a rub uh, when you're doing chest auscultation, or it can manifest as a pleural effusion, which you would pick up on chest x-ray. Or it can, the serositis can manifest as pericarditis, which you may note on EKG. Uh, you may note a pericardial rub. Or you can uh, see evidence of pericardial effusion, and that would typically be picked up on echocardiography. Renal disorder may be present. We saw that in this patient. So that can be persistent proteinuria, uh, more than half a gram per day, uh, or three plus cellular, uh, or, or sorry, or three plus protein on the urine. Uh, so either of those. Uh, or you can see cellular casts, and that could be red blood cell, cellular casts. We saw that in this patient as well. So what do we have so far in this patient? We got one, we got two, we got three criteria already. Uh, neurologic disorders. So that can be seizures or psychosis. Patient has uh, pre-existing epilepsy with no known cause, then uh, you're going to count that as criteria. And that has to be in the absence of any kind of metabolic derangements or offending drugs, of course. Hematologic disorders that can manifest hemolytic anemia, which would be a uh, normocytic to microcytic anemia uh, in a patient, plus or minus jaundice uh, or icterus. Uh, leukopenia, that's got to be measured twice, though. Uh, 
uh, or lymphopenia, which has got to be measured twice, or thrombocytopenia. As long as it's less than 100 with no offending drugs, one measure is enough. You can also cause immunologic disorders, uh, which are going to really give rise to a lot of these symptoms. So anti-DSDNA or anti-SMITH or anti-phospholipid antibodies and then a positive ANA titer. And like I said, four criteria, it's 95% specific and 85% sensitive for lupus. And mnemonic is SOAP brain uh, MD, S-O-A-P-B-R-A-I-N-M-D. And this is actually all of the clinical criteria that the American Rheumatologic Association puts out. So that's just a general overview of lupus. I talk about lupus in uh, the rheumatology section. Uh, I will put a link on here uh, after I'm done editing this video. So deficiencies of the lectin pathway. So the lectin pathway is, uh, there are other proteins other than just mannose binding lectin, uh, but that, this is really where you're going to see uh, the most common deficiency of the lectin pathway. And it really is not a well-studied immunodeficiency. The reason is, uh, or complement uh, deficiency, the reason is because it has a tendency to be asymptomatic. So it's not very well characterized because we haven't done a lot of studies on it, but essentially what it is is an accelerated clearance or poor function of mannose binding lectin. So even though it's common, it's not very clinically significant. However, when it does present is in patients uh, such as young children, and remember that children who are roughly between the age of 6 to 18 months, they are at risk for infections, and we see a lot of babies with infections, uh, but if you already have a pre-existing immunodeficiency, even if it's very clinically silent or not really significant, as MBL deficiency is, uh, if you add that on to the fact that they're in between that 6 to 18 month window, in between when they have maternal antibodies, uh, but before they develop a mature immunologic repertoire, then you add this mild immunodeficiency onto that, and they can really develop some serious uh, infections. So they can have skin abscesses, uh, cryptosporidial diarrhea, uh, even meningococcal meningitis. Uh, so if you have uh, serious infections in a young child, 6 to 18 months, may be worth it to get an MBL assay, and that's done by flow cytometry. Uh, so this can manifest in very young children, 6 to 18 months, or patients who are immunosuppressed, immunocompromised for other reasons. So they're on steroids. They're on uh, anti-rejection medications. They, uh, that's all I can think of really for now. I was going to say AIDS, but that's, that would cause immunocompromised serious problems on their own. So, uh, so patient on steroids, patient on cytotoxics for RA or uh, for... Uh, inflammatory bowel disease, or immunocompromised for any other reasons, uh, then mannose binding lectin deficiency can bear its ugly head. Deficiencies of the alternative pathway. So a lot of these are uncommon. Factor B deficiency, only a single case has ever been described. It was described in Brazil relatively recently, uh, and this patient had meningococcemia, as we would expect. So let's go back all the way back here to uh, the alternative pathway. So if you have a factor B deficiency, you are not going to be able to form uh, your uh, one of your uh, C3 convertases. Now that having been said, forming a C3 convertase, you can do it in two different ways. So it's only going to, all of these are only going to mildly increase your risk for meningococcemia uh, or Neisserial infections because you have a sort of a, 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 a fail-safe. Uh, by having two different ways of generating a C5 convertase. That is going to, uh, th that's going to contrast to if you have a deficiency uh, further down here after the C5 is formed, uh, then certainly you're going to be at risk for fulminant uh, meningococcal infections. Uh, so, okay, so that factor B, not going to come out on the test. Factor H deficiency. This results in an overconsumption of C3. So the reason is because and, and there's 
Uh, so there's two big things I want to talk about. Let me go back. I should probably should have put this in more places so I didn't have to keep going through here. Uh, but if you have a factor H deficiency, factor H is responsible for uh, sort of counterbalancing your C3 convertase from your alternative pathway side. So if you don't have factor H, or for that reason, if you don't have uh, for if you don't have factor I, uh, either of these, if you don't have them, then this C3 convertase generated on your, on your alternative pathway side is going to be overactive. And if it is overactive, you are going to cleave your C3 very avidly. And if you keep cleaving the C3 and generating C3B just constantly, even when there's not an infection present, then when it comes time to uh, when it comes time to activate your complement pathway and you do have an infection, you're going to be C3 deficient. And so this can result in infection. So you would think, well, my C3B BV C3 convertase is active. I should not be immunodeficient because I am forming lots of C3B and that can opsonize all sorts of things. The problem is you wear out your stores. Okay. All right, so you know it's really just analogous to when you have uh, TTP uh, where you're, uh, you have a thrombocytopenia and you have a tendency to bleed but uh, what's happening is you're, uh, you're combining all your platelets together. And so even though you may have more platelets, you get a thrombocytopenia because the platelets are clumping together and then therefore you have bleeding. So it's sort of analogous to that. You're wearing out your stores. Okay, so uh, another problem with this. It's associated with atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, glomerulonephritis, and macular degeneration. So let's go back here again. God, I really should have just put this later on too. Uh, but so remember what factor H does. Factor H binds to your own cells, to the sialic acid residues, and prevents factor B from cleaving on to your own cells. And that's good because if factor B was on your own cells, you would form uh, your C3 convertase in your own cells and you would opsonize your own cells. If you don't have factor H, what's going to happen? Factor B is going to be more likely to jump onto your cells and you are going to have uh, autoimmunity. And that can happen on your red blood cells, uh, which can cause a hemolytic, uremia, uh, hemolytic anemia. That can happen in your kidneys. Um, that can cause hemolytic uremic syndrome. Uh, and so you can get all sorts of autoimmune problems. Uh, it can also result in macular degeneration. That's not so much an autoimmune issue. That's because you have this overconsumption of C3. And with an overconsumption of C3 and with C3 deposition, uh, you get drusen. Drusen, C3 is a big component of drusen. Remember, drusen is what you find uh, if you look uh, with an ophthalmoscope in a patient with macular degeneration. It's kind of those little black spots. Okay, and then if you were to get an AH50, and AH50 is just like a CH50, but it measures your, your alternative complement pathway, that would be near zero. Factor D deficiency also results in an overconsumption of C3. Uh, again, it's because you can't generate uh, your C3 convertase on that side. Factor D is necessary for the cleavage of factor B. So this is an inability to activate the alternative pathway because remember you need cleavage of B, uh, of B to generate BB which is part of your C3 convertase. Um, so actually this should, this should say uh, deficient, uh, it results in deficient activity of the C3 convertase, not overconsumption. Uh, this results in an increased incidence of nicereal and systemic strep infections, and again here the AH50 is going to be near zero. Uh, Propertin deficiency. So this one is much more common uh, than the other ones. So this, so propertin, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to go all the way back here again. All right, so propertin is responsible for stabilizing the alternative C3 convertase. It, is, it stabilizes C3B, BB. If you don't have propertin, that C3B, BB, C3 convertase is going to be unstable, and so you're not going to be able to cleave C3 to C3B, 
And that's going to be even more problematic because C3B helps you form more C3 convertase. It also helps you form C5 convertase on the alternative side. So propertin deficiency is going to result not only in, there we go, not only in an increased risk of, uh, of infections with uh, pyogenic organisms because you have a decreased ability to opsonize because you don't have your C3 convertase, it's less stable, uh, but it's also going to uh, decrease your C5 convertase and that's going to put you at an increased risk for Neisseria infections. Propertin deficiency stands uh, alone of all of these deficiencies we're talking about uh, in that it is an X-linked immunodeficiency. I couldn't find if it was X-linked recessive or X-linked dominant, but I did find that affected uh, males are at 250 higher percent, or 250 times higher risk of Neisseria infection. So based on that, I am presuming with, uh, that this is an X-linked uh, recessive disorder. Uh, the AH50 is going to be diminished, but it will not be as low as uh, these other uh, alternative deficiencies that we've been talking about. And that, the reason for that is because propertin is simply responsible for stabilizing uh, the convertase. It's not responsible for forming it as the others are. So what do we do for workup? So who do we want to work up? That's an important question. And that's going to be any patient with repeated sepsis or nyserial infections, especially if it's in the setting of an autoimmune disorder. If they have autoimmune disorders or family history of autoimmune disorders. These patients should be worked up for complement deficiency. So you're going to get complement activity titers. That's your CH50 and AH50. So your CH50 measures your, you can see again here, this is very analogous to your PT and PTT of your coagulation system. So CH50 is going to measure the activity of C1, C2, C4, mannose binding lectin, C3, C5, and the terminal complement factor C6 through C9. If that's low, it suggests deficiency of one of those. The AH50 uh, will suggest deficiency of your alternative pathway, uh, and then the terminal pathway. So factor D, factor B, factor H, factor I, propertin, C3, C5, and the terminal complement factors. Uh, also, please note that, and this should make sense to you, if CH50 and AH50 are both low, you should consider that this is probably something further on down the pathway. So C3, C5, or a terminal complement deficiency, and that's because down there, these pathways converge. So if you have a problem down there, it's going to affect both CH50 and the AH50. Um, so I don't know exactly how these tests are run uh, per se. and It's not important that you know that. Just know that CH50 and AH50, if they're low, it suggests less activity uh, of, that, of the respective complement pathways. You can then do specific complement assays, and I would hold off on these until you know if your CH50 is low or your AH50 is low, because if your CH50 is low but your AH50 is fine, then you wouldn't want to get factor H, I, and B levels. You just need to get C3 and C2 levels. Uh, so these are sort of the specific complement assays you can get. You can also get C4 levels too. Uh, but run those uh, based on your CH50 and AH50 levels. And then, uh, if you're thinking of, uh, if you're thinking of, uh, well, we didn't talk about MCP, but you can get a flow cytometry for that. You can also get a flow cytometry for mannose binding leptin. So these are sort of your tests that you can do to work up for complement issues.